So to reduce the potential negative impact, some argue that the system should develop labels and guidelines, even separate criminal codes just for juveniles. In the terms of labels, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, outstanding organization, argued that those status offenders should be labeled as quote-unquote unruly children. Other states classified those who commit status offenses as a, as a PINS, a person in need of supervision, or a JINS, a juvenile in need of supervision, or a SINS, a child in need of supervision. Uh, still other states limited the types of charges that could be classified as a, a criminal offense. And uh, we're going to take a look at North Carolina in that regard. Uh, North Carolina, which uh, I indicated some different gang uh, concentration levels there in North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina developed five categories, according to the Governor's Crime Commission in 2010. They have an undisciplined type status, which is a juvenile who's committed an undisciplined type of status offense. Let's say they're a runaway or they're a truant or they're just a disobedient child and they're picked up for it. Two, a delinquent type status. This would be a juvenile who committed a curfew, alcohol, tobacco, or maybe a motor vehicle offense. That would not be a crime for adults, you know, like buy tobacco under the age of 18, but in the case of a juvenile, it would be a, a delinquency. Number three, criminal type status. A uh, case like this would be a juvenile who committed a curfew violation or motor vehicle offense. That wouldn't be a crime for adults, but is subjected to a criminal court. So this is, this is the dividing line here. Um, between the undisciplined and delinquent and the criminal type status. Number four is a civil type status, a juvenile who is under delinquency court jurisdiction for an infraction, but that it is civil in nature. So let's say it's a fishing game violation or non-criminal traffic type of thing. They got busted for a red light uh, um, camera uh, violation or something like that. And then last, we have an alien juvenile. Uh, this, this doesn't mean that they're necessarily, uh, um, you know, coming in from outer space and landing and committing crimes. Goodness knows we don't want that to happen. But uh, this is a non-citizen juvenile under the age of 18 who hasn't been charged with any kind of offense. The remaining concern with status offenders, though, is how to deal with chronic status offenders or those who commit multiple status offenses. And we're going to be taking a look at that a little bit later on as far as how we can appropriately deal with our juvenile delinquents and the chronic offenses that they uh, that they are involved in. So national crime statistics offer a pretty complicated portrait of uh, juvenile offending and victimization. And the statistics can sometimes be kind of confusing and contradictory. And this is where the measurement part of today's seminar comes in because you can make statistics mean whatever it is that you want them to mean, right? So in 2010, and we're waiting for the, the 2015 stats to come out, but we probably won't see them until 2017, 18, until they get regurgitated through the research process. But uh, as of 2010, over 1.2 million juveniles were arrested in that year. Roughly 54,000 of those were arrested for violent crimes, and you go, oh my gosh, 54,000, that's terrible. But when we take a look at that average of 1,000 or so per state, we understand that that represents almost a 12% decrease from 2009 levels, which is fairly impressive. Studies also show in the last five years, methamphetamine use among juveniles has dropped, but the use of prescription drugs is on the rise. You know, we have a smarter crop of juveniles coming into the system now. They're not quite as ignorant as the meth heads that we had uh, five and ten years ago. But they're saying, okay, well, I know this meth thing gets cooked according to whoever in the world I'm getting it from and who they're getting it from. So I'll just go with this good uh, prescription drug in here that, that mom takes, her painkillers, her oxys, and uh, use them because I know they're safe because, my gosh, you know, the doctor prescribes them, so they must be good to go. Studies also show the rate of violent victimization among juveniles between the ages of 12 and 17 is lower than those who are 18 to 20 years of age, but overall declined significantly since 2001. So we've had a good 10 years of violent victimization dropping, which probably is tied to some of the more uh, uh, harsh drug use, the cocaine and methamphetamine drug use. 
And a recent study suggests that about a third of juveniles are arrested by the age of 23. So we know that those are sensitive, highlighted periods uh, within the juvenile crime uh, timeframes. So these are reasons why understanding crime statistics, though, can be difficult. Because first, crime statistics can be very contextual. Uh, if we take arrest statistics for an example, there's a lot of different ways that arrest statistics can be influenced locally, right? When a police department decides to crack down on a certain kind of crime, such as drug use, the arrest for drug-related crimes uh, may increase. I, I know a, a very good friend of mine was telling me that he was at a Comstat meeting at his, uh, his police department, and uh, the chief was all upset because the mayor chewed him out because there was uh, too much crime happening downtown. So the mayor said, I want you to go and do whatever you need to do to reduce crime downtown. And so the chief said, okay, you know, if that's what you want, there's not enough visibility, you know, there's not enough visibility. Oh, okay, fine, we'll put more officers down there. So what did he do? He pulled officers from some of the zones, put them downtown. All of a sudden, the, uh, the local uh, news stations are um, uh, announcing this dramatic crime rate uh, increase in, down, in you know, downtown. And um, the mayor then goes to the chief and chews the chief out. Why can't you get control over what's happening downtown? The chief said, well, what are you talking about? You know, I increased it by 20%. And the mayor says, well, we have all kinds of crime down there. And it's like, okay, Mr. Mayor, you know what? Guess what? You have all the crime down there because we're catching all these people. And because we're catching them, the stats are up. So it's a catch-22. You know, If you don't want to have a, a, the, the crime stats, well, then don't put the people in there who could do the job and arrest the people and then have the political repercussions from it. So this contextual kind of problem we have when we understand juvenile crime, a lot of times... Uh, is not truly reflective of how much crime there is. It's reflective of how many people we've assigned to that particular juvenile crime problem. While we often examine crime statistics on an annual basis, crime tends to fluctuate between years just for different reasons. It may be due to a natural disaster that hits an area. It may be due to economic change and turmoil. It may be due to birth rates or something. So sometimes the fluctuation itself turns into a trend. And so sometimes the fluctuation is just an anomaly. So you have to you have to kind of take that fluctuation into account. And finally, we measure delinquency using a lot of different techniques. And each one of those techniques has its own strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes we maybe should or shouldn't rely too much on one particular method. We're going to be taking a look at those in just a couple of minutes. The juvenile justice system relies basically on three primary techniques for collecting data. And these techniques measure crime through arrests, through self-report surveys, and victimization surveys. And we're going to be taking a look at those three uh, basic types of techniques for collecting crime data so that we can better understand what we're talking about when it comes to juvenile crime and why we're looking at what we're looking at. Now, some of these techniques, for example, we're starting with uniform crime reports. You're going to say, oh, my gosh, I already had this uniform crime report stuff when I took intro to CJ. I'm so burned out on these things. Okay, I understand that. But what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to couch these in terms of juvenile justice rather than just uniform crime reports overall. And what a wonderful job the FBI does in collecting all these stats from the states. So just bear with me because it's important that we understand some of the differences between juvenile crime rate reporting and adult crime rate reporting. So when we take a look at the UCR, the arrest statistics for both juveniles and adults is most commonly derived from that report. Uh, UCR program, as you've probably learned from a different class, began back in the 30s. Um, in the 40s, we started to tie law enforcement agencies into it. By the 60s, every state was providing crime statistics to the FBI, and the FBI was consolidating all of that, all that data. Of course, in the 60s, computers were completely different than what they are today. You know, when you carry your cell phone in your pocket, you're carrying a computer that rivals probably anything we had during the 60s. And so the work we're doing with those statistics today is dramatically improved over what we were doing 50 years ago in the 60s when we were collecting these things. There's roughly 17,000 different police agencies across the country who are contributing information to the uniform crime reports. Every city, county, tribal, and state agency 
um, is alleged to be contributing information to the UCR. But I want to qualify that by just a couple of overview comments that you, that you need to understand and, and you need to take as a grain of salt. When, when we talk about how the UCR collects its data, we have to understand that the UCA, UCR collects it from three different categories. One of them is crimes known to the police. Now, this is data that includes crimes reported by the victims, the witnesses, or that the police uncover as a normal part of their job responsibilities. <laughs> a lot of these crimes may or may not be referred to the court system for charges at all. You know, we have the court system, which is a, a fantastic advantage for us in the United States as compared to a lot of other countries that don't rely on the court system as much as we do to give a citizen a chance at clearing themselves from being falsely accused of a crime or being able to negotiate what is for them the best possible outcome. Underlying that is the fact that we have a police discretion. And I would hope in our overly legalistic society that we don't take police discretion away from the men and women in blue who serve us on the streets because that is where the the true criminal justice um, statistics are made and born and and created and handled and managed because when you get pulled over for speeding it's up to that that man or woman in blue to decide if they're going to give you a ticket if they're going to downgrade the ticket, what the ticket's going to be for. I mean, that person who walks up to your car has a tremendous amount of responsibility on their shoulders. On one hand, they can go ahead and shotgun that ticket and give you six tickets for something. I mean, they can find a light that's burned out or a tire tread that's too thin or something, you know, that isn't right um, and just make you miserable and turn you into a citizen who can't stand the police and the law enforcement and the government and, ends up being some kind of a right-wing extremist type, or um, they can be too liberal, let you off with a warning when, in, in fact, you've been very reckless and give you the false impression that you can continue doing what you're doing, and, and, and in that way you end up hurting yourself uh, or others. So there's a balance that has that is committed millions of times throughout this country every year, tens of millions of times with every car that's pulled over, every uh, jaywalker that's stopped, every potential shoplifter that's stopped. I mean, just think of the tens of millions of, of opportunities we have in this country to charge and incarcerate people that we don't do such because that line officer out there on the street uses their discretion to determine how, just how serious the offense is in accordance with the statutes that they're, they're being paid to enforce. And when it comes to kids, say you have a 12 or a 13 year old kid who is experimenting out in the woods with building a fort and a campfire and, and, you know, the fire department had to come out and, you know, you have one officer who could write the kid up for arson and make his life completely miserable. You can have another one that would spend a half hour there lecturing the kid, making him feel crappy and sending him home. And, you know, with the kid getting away with it, but his parents being called and, you know, some non-adjudicatory kinds of things happening to the kid. So there's a, a tremendous amount of, um, I don't want to say garbage in, garbage out, but the crimes have to be known to the police. And there's a lot of crimes that are known to the police that never end up on the books. Crimes cleared by arrest is the second kind of category for the UCR. These, this data includes the number of offenses that have been cleared by an arrest. Cleared by an arrest does not necessarily indicate the number of people being arrested. For example, the arrest of one person may clear a number of crimes that were committed by that one person. You understand? So as say we have a youth who hasn't been involved in four different burglaries and they get arrested. Well, that clears the other three burglaries. So you, you, you have four crimes that took place, but you have one arrest. And then you have third, the number of persons arrested for part one and part two offenses. The data include the number of persons arrested for part one and part two offenses in any given year. These statistics are collected by age, race, gender, and location. And you say, okay, well, that's good. But the you know, other thing is, is that only gives you a limited number of criteria. So the data that's collected result in three annual publications and two semi-annual publications. The annual ones are, are titled Crime in the United States, Hate Crime Statistics, and Law Enforcement Officers Killed and Assaulted. 
The two semi-annual publications provide stats every six months and report changes since the last reporting period. And you can go to www.fbi.gov and you can get all the stats that you want. So what does the UCR tell us about crime? What good is it? Well, the UCR reports stats for both juvenile and adult crimes. The FBI classifies a, a juvenile as anyone under the age of 18. The FBI doesn't care about how they're defined by the individual state. The UCR does not report circumstances where youth are brought into custody for their own protection. Let's say they were involved in an abuse case or a neglect case. They, they didn't commit anything, so there's, there's nothing that hits the books. If we examine the amount of crime committed by juveniles relative to adults, we do find that juveniles contribute significantly, though, to the overall crime rate. Just over 22% of the property crimes and 14% of the violent crimes were committed by juveniles, according to the FBI, in 2010. So let's take a look at the crimes that juveniles have committed. And what I've done for you is I've taken a table in the list one text and uh, massaged it a little bit uh, so that um, so that you can appreciate the the order in which these things occur. So we have property offenses, two hundred and ninety thousand property offenses. Okay, well that's that's not a big surprise. Larceny and theft at two hundred and twenty three thousand. Drug offenses one hundred thirty three thousand and so forth. What I want you to do though is to take a look at the types of crimes that they're involved in. What we go from property offenses at almost 300,000, obviously better than a quarter of a million property offenses annually in 2010. But take a look at the flip side here where we're starting to get down into violent crimes 800 murders, 2,200 forcible rapes, 3,500 arson cases, 24,000, over 24,000 weapons violations, over 35,000 aggravated assaults. And this is, this is where we start to see a little bit bigger picture of uh, where we need to put our resources and what we need to be most concerned about. The property offenses, the larceny, theft, uh, even to a certain point, the drug offenses. Drug offenses may be uh, severely curbed as a result of our, our slowly changing mindset about the use of illegal drugs and, and this and that. Could be going up. We may be paying more attention to the problems the juveniles having as a result of uh, the fact that we're relaxing the enforcement of laws, which are still on the books federally, about marijuana and things like that. Uh, we may find that we're starting to pay more attention and investigate more and then find more cases of drug offenses actually out there. But I, I tried to set this up for you so that you could understand basically that from the 59,000 violent offenses down, we have some serious problems within our juvenile crime um, uh, situation. Now, violent crimes are important to study. According to the statistics we have from 2010, um, they don't re represent the majority of crimes committed by juveniles every year. Drug abuse violations, property violations, those are the bulk of the crimes actually being committed though. Um, we also need to take a look at things like curfew and loitering violations, which involve about 74,000 total in the system. So, you know, we have a large amount of violent offenses. We also have a large amount of uh, drug abuse violations and a little bit lesser kinds of crimes. And what we need to do is to kind of group these in bulk terms so that we can kind of appreciate uh, where we have to prioritize resources. And this is why research, this is why the, the, the kind of work that Dr. Listwan is doing and all the criminal justice researchers across the country, why they're so vitally important to us uh, in being able to prioritize how best to use the limited resources that we have and how best to understand the juvenile crime situation so we can proactively deal with what we need to deal with. So understanding crime statistics also requires an appreciation for how crime rates vary over time. Examining the crime rates across time allows us to see any potential patterns or any kind of trends that are emerging. And we know that the rate of delinquency peaked in the 90s and it's been leveling off in more recent years. Coincidentally, the birth rate's been leveling off 
and these people are beginning older. And so we don't have as many young people that were, you know, existing that could be uh, committing a lot of crimes. So obviously a lot of these crime stats are going to be depressed. It's kind of like when you want to brag about how your unemployment percentage has gone down. But what you do is you take out of the equation those people who aren't looking for a job anymore. You artificially depress the unemployment rate. So when you compare the unemployment rate today to the unemployment rate 20 years ago when we used to include everybody who actually doesn't have a job, uh, you can pat yourself on the back because your stats are lying to you about how well the entire national economy is doing. But we won't get into that because that's more of a political debate. Differences also emerge with drug abuse violations from what we see in the crime statistics, right? The crime rates rose dramatically in our drug abuse violations in 95. They kind of peaked there. They haven't declined to the same level that we've seen with violent crimes and property offenses, but they're still, you know, they're still not at that peak stage. Uh, liquor law violations, runaways, curfew violations. We see more stability over time with runaway charges following a more similar pattern to property and violent offenses. And so by taking a look at these trends over time, we can kind of appreciate a little bit more some of the significance of the statistics that we're looking at.